Hello, welcome to the Mindful Brush Workshop. I'm Steve, and I'll be presenting uh, part one of today's workshop, which is an introduction to mindfulness. And it'll be roughly 30 minutes long. So by the end, you'll understand what mindful practice is, and you'll know how to begin on your own if you'd like to, and you'll have experienced a brief mindfulness exercise. So Kishu Sensei, can you tell us about part two? Hi, I'm Kishu. I'll be presenting part two of today's workshop, an introduction to Japanese calligraphy that will also take about 30 minutes. By the end, you will understand the basic tools of calligraphy, how to get started on your own, and you have experienced a brief hands-on Japanese calligraphy exercise. All right, so if everyone's ready, let's get started. So a quick introduction. I am founder and executive director of Tasai, a Vancouver-based uh, artist collective, and we are creatives for the common good. And Tasai is how Kisu Sensei and I uh, know each other. I am also co-founder and chief creative officer of Secret Agenda. And we're a company that help artists define success for themselves and then gain the skills they need to design a life around that success. And then lastly, I am an artist. And my work arises from space being held for intuitive discovery. So my paintings are dependent on an open awareness to a moment in time. So you might have noticed that there's art in most of what I do, a common theme. So for me, mindful practice is really about caring for my creative self. So to get started, I'm going to explain the idea of open awareness. That's what I'm going to talk about for a little bit. Now, it's important to understand that open awareness or being able to consistently enter a state of open awareness is kind of like wanting to be able to run a marathon. So this is a long term goal that we're talking about here today. So if you did want to run a marathon, what you would do is learn about daily training exercises. And then it would be up to you to do those daily practices consistently over a period of time. And then eventually you would be able to run a marathon. So in the same way, today we're learning about the daily practices to which we might train our minds to gain a capacity for open awareness. And so it'll be up to you if this is something you want to pursue to then do those training practices consistently over a period of time and then you'll arrive at this long-term goal of open awareness. So is open awareness worth doing this daily practice for? Well, ultimately that's something for you to decide, just like whether you want to run a marathon or not. But here's some motivation for you. So mindful practice has been shown to reduce stress and anxiety and also to uh, increase focus and overall health. So there's been lots of studies done to demonstrate the benefits of daily mindful practice. But one that we're gonna focus on here today that might be of interest to everyone is mindful practice gives you an increased capacity to uh, respond to a situation rather than react to a situation. So what do I mean by that? Well, simply when you react to a situation, you do things that you don't necessarily want to do. But when you respond to a situation, you're responding creatively, appropriately, in the moment, by doing things that you do want to do. So to get a sense of this, uh, I'd like to do a little imagination exercise. I'll call it the reaction scenario. And so a scenario, bring, bring to mind a scenario where you regularly find yourself reacting to a situation in ways that you'd rather not, rather than responding to a situation in ways that you would like to. So for me, that scenario is usually around driving. So I was a commercial driver for 20 years and that context became a bit toxic for me. And so I often found myself uh, in situations where I was reacting in ways I'd rather not, rather than responding to a situation in, way, in, in ways I wanted to. And so I'm still kind of detoxifying from that. So for me, driving is often the situation I find myself in, in where I am reacting uh, rather than responding. So just 
bring this scenario to mind and I'd like you to think about uh, who is there, what's going on, where are you, what are the sights and sounds and smells. Really try to capture what it feels like to be in that place. And then to think about how you feel in this scenario. How does your body feel? Where are your hands? What are they doing? Uh, how, how are your shoulders? Are your shoulders up around your neck? Are they relaxed? What are your shoulders doing? Or in your gut? How are you feeling in your gut in this scenario? So I'd like to just uh, get a, a good clear picture of this reaction scenario. And then what I'd like you to do is uh, take a snapshot. So you're basically going to take a picture. So three, two, one, take a picture. And now what you're going to do is take that snapshot and just set it to the side. We're going to come back in a few minutes after we talk about open awareness, and then we're going to use that snapshot again. So what is open awareness? Well, to be in open awareness is to be three things at once, which is why it's not an easy thing to be. It takes some time and some practice to get there. So first of all, Open awareness is being present, very much like a dog. So dogs are very happy just being dogs and being where they are. So dogs generally aren't thinking about the time they spilled the dish last week, and they're not thinking about the meeting they have with the poodle next week. The dog is just happy to be there with you. So first of all, open awareness is this sense of being present, very much like a dog or like a golden lab. We have a little picture there. Second, open awareness is being in non-judgment. So very much like a grandma. So you don't have to have done something good to get a hug from a grandma. As a matter of fact, you might have done something bad and you'll still get a hug from a grandma. So grandmas have a way of making you feel safe and welcome by being in non-judgment. So open awareness is being in non-judgment like a grandma. And then lastly, open awareness is bearing witness. So like an old school journalist. So journalists, the real journalists, would listen to someone's story, value it as authentic, and then make it available. So they simply bore witness to the experience of others. So you can see how each one of these is in all three of these. So the dog or the golden lab is present and it's in non-judgment and just bearing witness to what's going on. And a grandma suspends judgment and then is present and bearing witness within that non-judgment. And then a journalist simply bears witness and is also in non-judgment and present to a moment. So they all kind of intertwine. So open awareness is being present, suspending judgment, and bearing witness. So let's try to imagine, because we may not have experienced this very much in our life, but let's try to imagine what being in a state of open awareness would be like. So I'd like you to return to your reaction scenario. So retrieve that snapshot you took and remember where you were, remember that scenario, and just spend a moment, if, if you're comfortable, just close your eyes, spend a moment of bringing it back to mind, remember who's there and what's going on and how you feel in your body. And now, in that moment, you magically show up in open awareness. And you are present to the moment, you're not judging the moment, and you're simply bearing witness to this moment. And how does that change things? What becomes available to you? What is now possible that wasn't before? So now that we understand what open awareness is, that it's a long-term goal, and there are daily practices we can do ourselves to gain open awareness, and they don't cost any money. And one of the benefits of open awareness is an increased capacity to respond to a situation rather than react to a situation. And we know that it's a capacity for three things at once, being present, being in non-judgment, and bearing witness. And then lastly, we hopefully got a little taste of what it might be like to show up in an actual situation in our lives where we're able to respond 
rather than react. So now let's move on to actually experiencing what a mindful exercise might be like that would eventually get you to a place of being able to uh, be in open awareness. So if you choose to pursue open awareness or something like it, this is what a daily practice might be like. Now before I get into actually guiding you through this mindful practice, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like you to know about just to prepare you for this experience if you've never done it before. So I need to let you know about monkey mind. And monkey mind is one of the ways to talk about that endless churning chatter that tends to constantly spin in our heads. And one of the first simple things mindful practice can give us, and one of the first things we need in our journey to open awareness, is a break from monkey mind. Now, a good way to think about monkey mind is kind of like a rainy day. So down under the clouds, we might be experiencing monkey mind. But up above the clouds, there's a calm state of mind. So this calm state of mind is always waiting for us up above the clouds. It's always there and always present. So even though down below it might be like experiencing a rainy day or experiencing monkey mind, we can always know that if we go up above the clouds, even for a little bit, for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, we know that up above the clouds, the sun's still there, a state of uh, calmness is there up above the clouds that we can reach and access. So we aren't trying to banish monkey mind. We're not trying to make it stop chattering. We're simply going to move away from monkey mind to visit the calm and sunny skies up above for a little while. So mindful practice doesn't solve the problems monkey mind is chattering about and it will simply give you a break from monkey mind, which has benefits in and of itself. It is literally uh, a rest for our minds, for our biologic brain, uh, from this constant spinning and churning that we tend to have going in our head. So it's good to remember that mindful practice is never coercive or harsh. And mindful practice is really about learning how to be gentle and patient with ourselves. And so we'll see our tendency when we do mindful practice is to get impatient with ourselves for not doing mindful practice properly. So it's one of the things that we learn to deal with this thought process as we go into mindful practice. So as we do this exercise, if you feel yourself getting frustrated, just try to set that aside. A really great image is of a little stream or a river in front of you. If you feel yourself getting frustrated, take that feeling in your hands and just place it into the little river in front of you and let it float away. Or if thoughts start coming to mind that you would rather not be there, again, don't get upset at yourself, don't get angry, don't get frustrated. In as much as possible, just take that thought in your hands, place it in the river in front of you. And if you start getting frustrated about the fact that you're frustrated, same thing. Just simply take those thoughts in your hand, as, bring your attention to it as gently as you can, place that in the little stream in front of you, and then return to your breathing. So we're going to find that in mindful practice, breath is the thing that we return to. Our breath is always present with us. It's always there. And so when that is a point of focus, we always have something that we can gently, mindfully return to. So let's begin an actual mindful practice. And this is going to be a very, very simple exercise. So you'll need to get seated, comfortably seated. Uh, try to sit with your back straight. And uh, one thing that helps, maybe just imagine a string coming out of the top of your head and imagine that string pulling up and pulling up. And then you just gently let it go and settle back down so you're comfortable. And you can put rest your hands uh, on your thighs, have your feet out in front of you, flat on the ground. So feel that firmness under your feet and feel the firmness of the seat 
under your sit bones, as our yoga friends often call it. So we're just resting in a neutral position as comfortably as possible and yet still alert and aware. And when you're comfortable, as you just breathe naturally, you can close your eyes and bring your attention to the breath going in and out. And we're going to start with a square breathing exercise. So imagine a square in front of you. And we're going to breathe into a count of four up one side of the square. And then we're going to hold that for a count of four as we go across the top of the square. And then let our breath out for a count of four as we come down the side of the square and then rest in natural breath for a count of four. And we're going to do that again. Breath in for four. And hold for four. And out. Rest for four. And one more time, in for four. And hold for four. And out for four. So that beginning centers us. It's helpful for me as I guide you through this mindful practice to center myself and to get ready for this. The next thing we're going to do is just try to become present to our own bodies. So imagine a hula hoop just up above your head hovering. And imagine that hula hoop slowly lowering down around your body and as it does so just bring attention to that part of your body that the hula hoop is passing by and so we start in our head we move down to our neck and we aren't judging making assessments about anything we're simply bringing attention to our body bringing awareness to our body so we go down to our shoulders and our arms, down around our torso, and then your hips. And again, feel the solidity of the seat underneath you. Feel your body grounded. So you move down to your thighs your knees, again just bringing attention to these parts of our body, becoming aware of our own embodiedness, down the lower part of our legs, down to our feet, and again just feel the solidity of the earth under your feet. Rest here just for a moment and bring attention to our breathing. And as you breathe in, try to experience the breath coming in like it's the first breath you've ever taken. And feel it in your body and then exhale. just bringing attention to this experience, calmly breathing,
And as we settle in now, we're going to start a simple exercise where we count to ten. And breath in is one, and out is two, in is three, and out is four. And so on up to ten. And because everybody has slightly different breath patterns, just follow your own natural breath. And as you breathe in, is one, out is two, up to ten. And when you get to ten, come back to one again. And we're just going to rest in this place, counting breath, calming our minds. And if monkey mind starts wanting attention, Again, we'll just take those thoughts, gently gather them up, place them in the stream in front of you, and just let them float away. As you bring attention to your breath, try to remain in a natural breathing pattern. Try not to overemphasize breathing in or overemphasize breathing out. Think of a smooth, fluid transition between in Rest here for a while, just counting our breath. exercise. So we'll feel, I hope we'll feel the benefits of getting ourselves to this place of, of attention on our breath, of being in our bodies. And we're going to do a very simple relaxation exercise. So as you breathe in, I want you to bring attention to a part of your body. We're going to do similar to the exercise of the hula hoop. We're going to start at the top of our head. And as we breathe out, I'd like you just to release tension from that part of your body you're bringing attention to. So first our head. And then our neck. Release tension out. And then our left shoulder. And release the tension. And our right shoulder. Release that tension. And our left upper arm. As you breathe out, let it flow. and then our right forearm and release the tension 
And then both of our hands together. Bring attention. And let the tension go. And now our chest. And breath out and let tension go. And our upper back. go and now our abdomen in the front let the tension release and our lower back let that tension release and then both hips together Let that tension go. And one more time with our hips. Just bring our tension gently there. And a breath out, let it go. And our left upper leg. Let the tension go. Right upper leg. Release the tension. And then our left lower leg. Release the tension. And right lower leg. And now our feet. As you bring attention to your feet, breath in. And feel the tension flowing out the bottom of your feet down into the ground and away. And one more time, all the tension from the top of your head down through your body, down to your feet and away. And one last time, from the top of your head, feel the tension flow down through your body down to your feet and away. And we'll bring our attention back to our breath and center our breath again. Bring awareness to the breath in and out. calmness, feel the relaxed state we're in. And as you're ready, just wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, come back present to your body, to the world outside. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So how was that experience? We would really like to hear from you if you'd like to put some comments down below and let us know how that went for you. Now we're going to transition to the second part of our workshop and we're maybe all feeling rather calm and relaxed and so just to make sure we're wide awake when we begin the next section with Kisu Sensei, I'd like to transition to the second part by briefly introducing uh, the mindful circle. And this is uh, a concept developed in partnership with mindset coach Akshay Karpur. So the way to think of the mindful circle is uh, a small little circle. So usually this is kind of a when we react to things around us there's something a, some stimulus something that triggers us that we react to and if you imagine a small little circle there's almost no pause as you go around this little circle and then all of a sudden we're reacting without knowing that we are having thought about what it is we want to do in this moment now in contrast to that imagine a larger circle 
and something triggers us and it takes longer to get around that circle there's more of a pause and then in that pause we can respond a response emerges I'd like to read this quote by Viktor Frankl who is a psychologist and uh, a Holocaust survivor so this comes from uh, hard-won life experience and Viktor Frankl says this so between stimulus and response there is a pause in the pause lies our power to choose our response and in the response lies our growth and our freedom let me read that again between stimulus and response there is a pause and in the pause lies our power to choose our response and in the response lies our growth and our freedom so we can think about open awareness as being in the center of this mindful circle and as we gain a capacity for open awareness it expands the circle it expands the pause and there's a greater chance of in that pause in that pregnant pause of us responding to a situation rather than simply reacting to a situation so uh, this drawing behind me it's uh, a little weird drawing the the dog and the grandma and the journalist every single time so to remind me of this of open awareness in the center of the mindful circle I like to put this character which in Japanese is mu and translated literally as nothingness or nothing uh, but on its own like this it speaks to a sort of nuanced and difficult to communicate concept that shows up in a lot of Eastern traditions and in meditation traditions so uh, in Chinese you may have heard of the idea of Wu Wei or trying not to try or uh, in the tr Christian tradition of kenosis uh, of an, a self emptying so it's this idea of something in the center there's an emptying a letting go that creates space for something else so within the mindful circle open awareness is this significant nothingness that creates room for a pause and then in the pause is our power to choose a response and in the response lies our growth and freedom so I commissioned Kisyu Sensei to create this image which is Mu, representative of open awareness in the center of uh, what is an Enso circle that represents the uh, mindful circle. And that brings us to uh, the connecting point with our, the second half of our workshop. So mindful circle is just our recent attempt to put some language around uh, thinking about what's going on but the mindful circle came from a discussion about the Enso and you may have seen an image similar to this in uh, Japanese restaurants or in a number of places people often use it as a logo the Enso comes from there's actually a, a, a Japanese Zen Buddhist practice of drawing the Enso and it's a daily mindful practice where what you do is simply draw one circle and the whole idea is less about the drawing that you get at the end and it's more about being present to a moment getting yourself centered and in non-judgment drawing that circle and you ca capture something of that moment and so the ongoing practice is called Hitsu Zen Do which is loosely translated as way of Zen through the brush so this drawing the Enso is uh, is representative of the mindful circle handy for our purposes but it's also a way to actually practice mindfulness on a daily basis if you'd like so with that we will now head to the second part of our workshop with Kisyu Sensei hi everyone welcome to the second part of the workshop introduction to Japanese calligraphy again my name is Kishu. I'm a Japanese calligrapher. I've been doing Japanese calligraphy over 25 years now. And I create Japanese calligraphy art, teach 
and also do live performances. Let me show you some pictures so that you have better understanding of what I do. Okay, so this first picture is me doing a live performance at the Powell Street Festival a couple of years ago. And this is my big calligraphy brush. It is hard to control, but it is so much fun uh, to write uh, calligraphy on a big sheet of paper uh, with the big brush and using lots of, lots of Sumi ink. Um, I love using this big brush during my performance. And this is one of my um, art uh, um, artworks. Uh, it says dragon. So this is not very traditional Japanese calligraphy writing, but I create not only traditional, but also a modern style of calligraphy to express myself better and also communicate with people who don't uh, necessarily understand uh, Japanese uh, written languages. And this is also one of my art. Um, this, the writing itself is more towards traditional style. However, I sometimes um, mix with a photo and calligraphy to express myself better. Uh, it says uh, Ajisai, uh, the flowers that's uh, blooming in June, July. And this is the photo of um, cute baby and also uh, Mei Mei Shou, which is uh, known as a baby's name certificate. And it is a Japanese tradition to write baby's newborn, newborn baby's name uh, with the calligraphy to wish their healthy life. And the last picture I have is um, I create art for commercial use as well. As well. So this is the example, um, uh, like one of them. I worked with the Marutama ramen shop in Richmond. And yeah, I was um, yeah, very honored to write my calligraphy on their uh, brand new shop on, on the white wall. All right. Okay, so I hope you have a better understanding of what I do and also uh, what kind of um, calligraphy art I create. Okay, so now, now I would like to switch my camera to my hand camera. And I would, I would like to introduce um, some of the basic Japanese calligraphy tools. So here you see brush, we call it fude in Japanese. And then you have this um, stick type of sumi ink. And then this is also sumi ink, but uh, this is a liquid type of sumi ink. And then here is suzuri, which is ink stone case. So this is made out of stone. And then lots of different kinds of um, ink stone cases. Uh, so this is probably the most common shape of for uh, suzuri ink stone case. And also, it could look like this. So this one has a little cute, um, um, what is, what are they? These are dragon shapes and patterns on this stone. And the one I have here is not black, but the red stone. Okay, and also this is calligraphy paper. We call it hanshi paper. And then this is bunchin. It is a paperweight. And here you see this black felt mat. And it is quite important to have this felt mat underneath 
this calligraphy paper because um, you will add quite a bit of pressure with your brush uh, when you're writing on this paper. And then the paper is really, really thin. So it might move around. So you want to uh, put this bunching and also have this felt mat underneath. You could use newspaper or plastic sheet, but they don't absorb um, the liquid quite well. So you might want to use the felt mat instead. Okay, so these are uh, the basic Japanese calligraphy tools that you would need to in order to start Japanese calligraphy. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, brushes. So this is a brush. These are the brushes that I provided today, prepared today. And there are lots of different kinds of uh, calligraphy brushes in different sizes. So this is the most uh, common size of the brush you would use when you're practicing. And this is called chuhude. So it means a middle size brush. And then these are a small brush. We call it kofude. So these would be useful when you write uh, your name on your uh, calligraphy artwork. And this is uh, the fude that's made out of horse hair. So that's why it's um, a horse or goat hair. Uh, this is white fur. Um, and actually this one is uh, the hair of squirrels. So that's why a little bit darker compared to this, uh, the mix of horse and goat um, hair. And this one is made out of uh, bamboo. So usually these, only this part that you hold uh, is made out of bamboo, but this, in, this, uh, in this case, this brush is made out of like bamboo from here to here. Can you see? And the last brush I have here, um, this is so much bigger compared to this uh, regular sized brush. Um, yeah, so when you want to express yourself uh, on the bigger sheet of paper, um, this would be a perfect, perfect um, size of the brush. And a lot of, um, a lot of brushes hair, um, is uh, animals' hair. Uh, sometimes the brushes that are made out of, you know, bamboo or uh, other materials, but the most common material uh, for um, brush hair is animals' hair or fur. And don't worry, we shave their hair uh, not to, not, we don't take their lives. Okay, and also, I would like to talk about Sumi ink. I'm going to take this away. Okay, so Sumi ink has two, uh, two different, um, I would say, forms. So one is the stick type of Sumi ink and the three main ingredients for this sumi ink are uh, suit and um, glue, which is called nikawa, nikawa glue. Uh, that's made out of animal skin or uh, fish bones. Uh, they boil those for a long, long time to make it sticky. Um, then we add, uh, uh, people add uh, uh, perfume to make the, the sumi smell uh, better. And so these sumi st sticks are made by hands, handmade, and they come in these type of boxes. So I, I prefer to have sumi ink, a sumi stick ink into this type of wooden box because sumi is alive. So um, 
when when they're when they're kept in the box, uh, they can breathe. That's why I prefer to have my swimming in this type of kitty box. But um, sometimes they come in uh, with this type of like paper box or cloth box, um, which is which is totally fine. Um, yeah, no problem. But um, just my preference. <laughs> I would like to have this one. Um, yeah, and also we have this type of uh, bottled ink, so liquid ink. Um, it's already made uh, the liquid ink, so you don't need to rub ink. Uh, it's very easy to use when you're practicing and you don't have time to grind your ink. Um, but this is machine made. Um, ingredients will be the same or similar. Sometimes uh, the black uh, color comes uh, from the carbon black, not the soot. Um, so that could be a difference between um, the liquid ink uh, packed in the bottles or and um, the stick type of uh, semi-stick semi -stick ink. Okay, and in order to get the sumi ink, how do you make sumi ink? So when you, when you want to start uh, calligraphy, I mean, you could use the bottled ink, then you don't have to make, but um, this is a, a big difference uh, between, uh, let's say, oil paint, um, watercolor paint, acrylic paint. You, in calligraphy, you have to make your own sumi from this stick. And how you do that? So this is a stone ink case, and you add a little bit of water um, in this um, the Suzuki, the ink stone case, and then you rub this sumi stick here. And when I use the word grind, people tend to put a lot of like foes and then try to like grind really hard, but please, <laughs> please don't grind too hard because you may uh, scratch your uh, Suzuki, the surface of this stone. So just really, really gently as if you're uh, touching, you know, baby's head like this. It, it might take a while to make a lot of amount uh, of ink. So probably if you can do 10 to 15 minutes before you start your art, that would be great. You will have enough ink for um, more, than, more than 10 sheets, probably. And this ink making is not only uh, for, you know, making ink, but also it is good for meditation. So um, since this takes, takes a while <laughs> to make a lot of ink, um, just try to relax when you're making sumi ink and try not to think too much. And as Steve was, um, explaining and introducing you to the mindfulness practice. This is very helpful. And I do recommend you to do this before you work on your calligraphy art. And I can start to smell um, the nice sumi smell. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And so today we don't have too much time. So I'm going to add this bottled ink. Usually you don't want to mix those two together, but just because today we don't have enough time, um, I will mix them and use this.
Okay, so now you know what tools you need in order to start Japanese calligraphy. And what's next? You need to learn a couple of、um, basic, basic calligraphy、uh, lines. So, in calligraphy, there are lots of rules if you would like to、uh, learn traditional style of calligraphy. And when you master all those rules,、uh, your, your characters will look beautiful. So, today I would like to introduce you to、uh, very basic rules、uh, for horizontal and vertical. Lines. So it might look very simple, but it actually has a lot of things going on. Okay, so let me write a horizontal line. Oh, before that, I would like to, I would like you to hold your brush properly. So I prefer to use these three fingers. So first, you clip. Uh, this this、uh, bamboo part with these two fingers, and then you support from the back with this third finger, the middle finger. So, this is the one way of holding your brush, but also you can have your、uh, the middle finger like forward front and then hold like this if you want to. But I prefer this way. So today I'm going to hold my brush this way. Okay, so this is how you write horizontal line. Do you see this part? And this part has a little triangle. Okay, let me show you again. Okay, so what is happening at the very beginning is、uh, make your brush tip pointy and then place your, your brush 45 degree angle. Here is 45. And after you placed your brush in 45 degrees, twist your brush towards the direction you want to go next, which is the right. And when you get to the end, lift your brush up so that your tip goes up and the whole brush goes down, down as in diagonal down. And then If there's a little bit of hole here, you can go back a little bit to fill the gap. So, this way, you have this triangle, the beginning, and also at the end. Let me show you again. One 45 degree, twist your brush straight, lift your brush up. Down and go back. So, this is how you write a horizontal line. And next, I would like to show you how to write vertical lines. Make sure you're holding your brush properly. And, and if your hair is sticking out like this, please go back to your ink wall and then try to make it tidy. All right, so this is how you write vertical line. Do you see 
there is a triangle here and also here. So same as when you wrote horizontal lines, you start with 45 degree angle and then twist your brush. In this case, you want to go down. So you face, the, your brush is facing down and then lift your brush a little bit up and the tip goes to the left and then the whole brush go down and then there is a little hole there so you want to go up to fill the gap again 45 twist straight lift your brush up a little bit the tip goes toward the left I mean, bottom left, bottom, and up. Does that make sense? And make sure your brush has enough ink. Okay. So there are lots of different kinds of vertical lines. But today I would like to show you one more. Okay, so this one you stopped at the end. However, there is this kind of vertical line, which has a little bit of a jump or wing or whatever you want to say. Again, 45, twist, go down. And then now you, go, you want to go towards bottom left and then scoop to make this triangle. Let me do it again. 45, twist, straight down and go towards bottom left and then scoop. Does it make sense? Okay, so let's review all those three lines that we practiced just now. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. So this calligraphy paper has two sides. One is smooth and then the other one is a little rough. Basically, uh, you want to use this smooth side. However, if you would like to get a little bit more dry brush feature, you could use uh, the opposite side, the back side of the, the paper as well. But if you're uh, submitting your art to competition or um, the exams, yeah, please use the right side, which is um, the smooth side. Okay, so here is horizontal line that we practiced. I'm gonna do it again. 45, twist, straight, lift your brush up, down, and go back. 45, twist, straight, lift your brush up, go down, and go back. And vertical line, 45, twist, straight, lift your brush up, left, bottom, and up. Again, 45, twist, straight down, go to the left, bottom and up. And there's this little special vertical line with a little tick. And before you jump, make sure your brush goes towards bottom left and then scoop. So I hope you can remember all these 
um, three very basic um, lines for kaisho, which is a block style of Japanese calligraphy writing. Um, in calligraphy, there are five different styles of writing, and each style has uh, different rules. So if you would like to master all these, um, the eight different styles, you may have to learn five styles, um, the eight, eight rules, eight stro strokes times five kinds. So about 40, 40, uh, 40 rules. <laughs> that sounds a lot. Okay, now I would like you to try uh, writing a kanji character with, with um, those three lines that you just practiced. So if you are able to write those three lines properly, that means you can write this kanji. Okay. So the kanji that I would like you to write is this. Can somebody tell what this says? So this kanji means circle. It's in in Japanese. It's circle. Just because we will be writing enso circle uh, at the end of this workshop. So I thought this would be a perfect kanji to practice. And look, this kanji has all these lines that you practiced, horizontal line, oh, sorry, vertical line, horizontal line, vertical with the tick, and then again, vertical and horizontal. So I thought this is a perfect kanji for you. Okay, let's write it again. So you start with vertical, and then you do the triangle at the end. And the next stroke will be horizontal. And now this horizontal, horizontal line turns into vertical. And go towards bottom left and let go. And vertical line, very short one. And then horizontal line. Okay, so this is a stroke holder. One, two, three, and four. So this is the traditional style of Japanese calligraphy. But what if your friend doesn't know how to read Japanese and Chinese character. How do you, how would you tell your friend this kanji means circle? Then a little bit of modern style of um, technique you may be able to use. Something like this. This is still the same kanji. In, but I made this square part into circle since this kanji means circle. And what if you write it really, really thick? and circle. This kind of already looks like Enso circle, doesn't it? And even if you stick with 
um, square shape, the original shape. Maybe you could do something like this. Very thin. And also very thick. Don't they give you different feel when it's written very thin or and uh, very thick? So that's something you can do um, after you master uh, all these basic strokes. You get to play with it and then um, be a little bit more expressive. You don't have to stay with uh, traditional, on just, just traditional uh, calligraphy. That is a fun part of uh, modern calligraphy. Okay. So I would like to move on to the last activity, activity of this workshop, which is writing an insole circle. So insole circle, you, in order to write insole circle, you don't need to worry about any rules you just learned. Just be yourself relax and draw a circle. And that circle doesn't have to look pretty or mathematically perfect. And you can, you can write in so or a circle from bottom to top, top to bottom, clockwise, counterclockwise. It's all, it all, it's all up to you. So I would, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> one, I said no rules, but one rule, um, I would like you to draw the circle in one go. Try not to stop and take a break. Just even, even if, even though you're, even if you're writing it slowly, that's okay. But I want you to um, keep your brush uh, on, on the paper the whole time. Okay, so um, I would like you to close your eyes and then and then um, yeah, just relax and um, we will take a, a minute, about a minute um, to meditate before we draw a circle into a circle. So okay, so. Prepare a blank sheet of calligraphy paper and sit straight. Close your eyes and breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in and out. Keep breathing in and out. Can you hear your heartbeat? Do you feel the peace inside of you? Okay, now you can open your eyes and start writing an insole circle. So this is my Enso circle. What kind of Enso did you create? 
Thank you so much for your participation. We hope you enjoyed your experience. So if you'd like to get in touch with either of us, uh, Kisyu Sensei can be reached at www.kisyuu-calligraphy.com. And I can be reached at www.secretagenda.art. And if you'd like to get a hold of both of us or our collective in Vancouver, you can head to www.tasai.ca. Thanks again, everybody.